How you doing, people? Welcome back to another ESO video. Today is the class guide for the Necromancer. If you like dealing with dead bodies, raising them from the ground, and then firing, forgetting them because they don't mean anything, then you are going to love this class. You have a corpse system that you can take advantage of. You have very high health, great sustainability regardless of the way you play because of certain buffs and bonuses. And of course, you can turn into a massive skeleton, which we all like. So if you want to see more of this, stay tuned. I'm going to go over absolutely everything. So the basic aesthetics for the Necromancer are, of course, death and skellies and pets and stuff. Yes, we have pets, but unlike the Sorcerer, our pets are fire and forget. They're not double bar the pet, otherwise it dies. They don't stay there forever with a certain amount of health. They kind of, you cast it, it has a timer, recast it after the timer is over. We do have a system now where you can illuminate dead bodies and you can utilize them for lots of different skills so you can benefit from them in many different ways that could be sustainability ulti recovery um also the ability to fire off extra pets you can siphon health from an actual body on the ground or resources or turn it into a massive heal for the group there's lots of different things you can do that may sound complicated on the surface don't worry i'm going to go over all the skills anyway so basically how do you start so with the Necromancer, you've got three different skill lines. Now, with this being one of the newer classes to the game after the Warden, this does follow suit mostly when it comes to their three design skill lines for the three particular roles. So generally speaking, across the board, and some do cross over with classes, you have a DPS-y skill line, a tanky skill line, and a Healy skill line. This does pretty much line up here. But again, some do cross over. So you want to mix and match a little bit. But how do you level up the skill lines? So these are 50 at the moment, obviously, because this is a demonstration template on the PTS. But basically, slotting one skill from each skill line is what you need to do first of all. Regardless of what the skills do, being there is enough. So one from Gravelord, one from Bone Tyrant, one from Living Death each one of these skills on your bar so long as you gain xp while on this bar will contribute to leveling up the skill line so if you level this flame skull skill up any xp contributing towards that skill also contributes towards the entire skill line so these at later dates can be unlocked same goes for your passives they are all set at checkpoints of levels and all you need to do is gain xp while one of these skills is present. Now, if you put more skills from each skill line on your bar, it will level the whole skill line faster. But obviously, if you take them off, then it won't level it at all. So when you hand in a quest or kill enemies, be aware that the bar you are on is important for your skills progress. So let's go into the dps -y stuff first of all. We've got the Gravelord skill line. Now, this is throwing skulls, throwing skeletons, graveyard stuff, and fun. So basically, you start off with Flame Skull. This is quite simple. It goes on your bar, and you hit dummies with it. You don't. You go into content and hit things with it. Hitting dummies is boring. But we're going to show you on a dummy anyway, because that's all we've got. Basically, you would light attack first, or light attack after. Entirely up to you, if you wanted to take advantage of weaving. Light attack weaving and heavy attack weaving is a very important part of combat in the Elder Scrolls Online. There's a link there if you want to know more about it. But, you fire a skull. Quite simple. Does fire damage. But, as you saw there, the animation changes on the third one. Why is that? Quite simple. Every third cast increases the damage it deals by 50%. So if you cast one, two, then the third one, one, two, then the third one, every time you cast the third one, it does a big boom and it hits harder. Now there's two morphs to this. One is also flame damage again, but the third cast ricochets and bounces to other enemies. So you cast and cast in the third one again, does more damage, but it bounces two times to nearby stuff. So it hits multiple targets. The other one is Venom Skull, which now converts it to a stamina costing ability. This now does poison damage instead of fire and every third cast does have enhanced damage, but while slotted, casting any Necromancer ability while you're in combat counts towards the first ca third cast. So basically here, what you need to do is, 
if you cast any of these skills, this starts racking up stacks. So if you look at my buff bar at the bottom there, you can see I've got one skull there in the purple background with a green thing. It looks exactly the same. If I cast other abilities, brief spoiler here, while in combat, you'll see it's now up to three. So I can fire it. If I cast any Necromancer abilities, it stacks them up. Even without firing the skill itself at all, I always have the biggest version. So the trick to this um, skill, rather than just spam, spam, get the third one, which you can do, is to use other abilities, and then when it's at its peak, utilize it for the big one. Now, bear in mind, you saw me cast with two hands there. Why is that? That is because one, two, third one, or you can stack up lows and hold the three, wait for the magicka to come back, and then fire the two-handed ones. What you really need to do is only stack up two because your third cast is what counts. You can even stack up to three or fire it on the third. So technically speaking, if you only cast two Necromancer skills, your third one is always ready. So if you were to cast these two abilities here, so you fire one, you gotta be in combat first, one, two, and then fire that. That adds to how some of the skills line up later. It's really useful to understand that bonus. So again, in combat, one, two, third one, fire the double skull or the double hands. So while it does need to stack three, you only need to pre-stack two because the third one is the one you've just cast. That is your spammable if you want to utilize it like that. Or again, you can time it and track it. Now, Blast Bones is obviously one of the most fun skills on the Necromancer because this throws a skeleton. Quite simple, you have to have a target, and when you activate it, summons a skelly. Boom. Explodes. Brilliant. Now, that is direct... Oh, champion points. That is direct damage in area of effect. So, direct damage doesn't mean single target. Direct damage means one time hit. It is a direct attack which explodes. There's just flame damage to all nearby enemies within a 6 meter radius and can be fired from 28 meters away. Now... If you morph this, you can morph it into another fire version. But this one does more damage the further away from the target it is. But it's only if it chases the target. It's not if it's 28 meters or less. It's if the target moves and it has to chase it. The more it has to chase, the more damage it does. So if you're in PvP or something and something's running away. Or in PvE and something's running towards somewhere else. This will escalate. Outside of that, the other version converts to stamina. So it costs stamina now. But it does disease damage. And healing received is nuked by um, being hit by this. So anyone that does get hit by this is affected by Major Defile. That is quite nasty in PvP. It's not too essential in PvE situations unless the boss heals a lot, but basically this is a stamina variant. Now bear in mind, Blast Bones does have a timer. Because it is traveling or because it is trying to summon, you can't cast it like a normal spammable. It actually has a two second gap. So generally speaking, when people are trying to figure out their rotations, if they're doing DPS or whatever it is they're doing, this is just for argument's sake, they will slot other skills in between. You can do a heavy attack or you can do a light attack skill, light attack skill, and that's normally enough time to fire it. So if you see here, it is grayed out. When it is grayed out, you can't recast it. It does have a seven second timer just in case the target is running away, but generally speaking, it will take two. You see here, one, two, fire. Now, the way to trick that into being partly spammable is to apply it with light attack hit, light skill, light skill. It goes bang, light cast. One, two, three. One, two, three. Regardless of the skill you're using, if it's an insta cast, that is the timer for constantly keeping the uptime for Blast Bones. It's entirely up to you how you go about that. It's entirely up to you how you make your build, but that is how you trigger that. Um, successfully without having to sit there waiting for it to not be grayed out. Boneyard, nice and simple. This puts an ice area of effect ability on the ground. As you can see, big circle, quite large actually. Gravestones, ice damage inside. We have targets. There's damage over time. That will differ depending on how you're built. Bear in mind, Ice damage. Fire or disease from the blast bones. 
fire or poison from the skull, ice damage from the boneyard. Now that will last 10 seconds and an ally standing in it can take a synergy doing frost damage and air of effect and the damage to the enemies in the area will heal the group. So the damage that it does will heal people. Very handy synergy. Obviously make sure you take that if you see it. But it consumes a corp on cast if there is one present. And if you do, it will actually do 30% more damage. So when there are bodies on the ground, like this, wrong button. You can utilize that for more damage. That was deliberately crossed over because there is something very important about blast bones. Yes, we're going backwards a bit. Each morph of this, regardless of its type, will leave a body on the ground. And the way to spot bodies is to look for the highlighter on the ground. Look at the body. See that blue stuff? That is very, very important for the Necromancer. That is the corpse system. Now, for a Templar, you'll only ever see that if you have Repentance and it will be yellow. For the Necromancer, you're going to see that a lot. Every dead body, player, enemy, or pet, will look like that. Understand that very, very early on. These will make a bit more sense. Unnerving Boneyard applies major breach to enemies in area of effect, reducing their physical and spell resistance. So essentially the same skill, the same application, the same benefit from a corpse, but as well as doing damage, it will apply a resistance debuff to up to six enemies. Any skill with a debuff is capped at six. The damage isn't, but the breach is. The other morph, however, you can use your own synergy. So it applies the same, but rather than your group having to apply the synergy for the heal and the damage to happen, you can do it. Happy days. Bear in mind, of course, that heal is based on the damage done. So, ground stuff. Very easy to apply. Very easy to understand. Make sure you keep them up. Now we've got Skeletal Mage. This is another pet. It lasts for 20 seconds, which is quite long, but it's not like a sorcerer pet where you have to double bar it or it dies. It will eventually die anyway. But when it does, it will drop a corpse. Again, you can use that. So, for 20 seconds, the mage attacks the closest enemy every two seconds with shock damage. Now, pets do have certain rules. So, if I hit this, he'll hit that target. It's the closest one. That's what he's been told to do. He will still do that. So, unlike other pets where if you heavy attack, they change target, this one does not. He will only ever hit the closest one. So now he'll hit a different one. He changes when I move. Unlike other pets, it's not about which one you heavy attack. It's about which one you are near. So bear in mind, that is important. It's basically a, a dot of sorts. It's not a damage over time. They're actually direct hits. But it's a long duration, constant attack. Shock damage, mage, at base. Then it changes. So, one is Skeletal Arcanist. Again, that is still a mage of sorts, and it still does shock damage, but it does damage in area of effect as well. So it's direct damage on initial hit, but then it pops. So it does burst damage when it lands. So that's more area of effect application. So within five meters of the target, quite nice. Skeletal Archer, however, changed it to a stamina variant. And it now does physical damage instead of shock. And it is an archer. It's got a bow and arrow. The damage, however, escalates. Each time the archer deals damage, its next attack will be 15% more damage than the previous attack. So this gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. So as far as single target is concerned, outside of damage types, depending on what you want to spec for, this one actually does more damage over the duration. So it would pay you to make this last the maximum amount. Don't overcast it too much. It does fire exactly the same. Cast it, and it will hit the closest target. That will ramp up. As you can see there, that was a crit. They can crit. That will go up and up and up. So the longer it's available, the more damage it will do. 
again, to start with, that's going to look quite low. It depends on how you build. We're not built for anything at the moment. We've just got some basic uh, tutorial stuff on, so nothing special. Again, body. Body from Blast Bones. Body from pets. All pets drop corpses when they die. Another tip, by the way, if you do recast this by accident, don't worry. If it's got seven or so seconds left, you actually drop the body nice and early. And that applies to any pets. Any that have a long duration once they get to seven seconds, if you recast it, there's a body. Shocking Siphon. This is what your corpses are for. So we put this on the bar. This will make a beam that basically tethers itself to you. And any enemies caught inside of this will take shock damage between you and the beam. Anyone inside of it. Also, while slotted, all of your damage increased um, by 3%. So what we need, first of all, is a body. Blast Bones, easiest way to cast a corpse. Bang. Then we consume it for free. Error of effect damage to everyone caught inside that radius. And a tether so that other things can be caught inside of it as well. Anyone caught in that beam will take damage. And yes, you can go round them and all this good stuff. But they're close enough anyway. Again, that does shock damage initially. Now that will change. So it's got an error of effect on application in the area that the body is in and then a beam that you can just run around with. 28 meters is a long beam. Two morphs. Mystic Siphon. Your health, magicka, and stamina recovery are increased while siphoning from a corpse. So you've got a higher recovery across the board and it still does shock damage. The other morph, however, Detonating Siphon, is now disease-based instead of shock. It lasts the same duration, does the same amount of damage, but obviously with a different status effect if you're lucky. But when it ends, it explodes. Yes, I'm sure some of you are already ahead of me here. So we'll fire a corpse. And we'll take advantage of it. Fires the same, does the same, looks a little different, different color beam. But does damage, great. When it ends, it goes bang. So I'm going to let that finish so you can see the pop. And then I'm going to demonstrate what you can do if you want to be a bit more tactical with it. There's the pop. Now, what if we have more than one corpse? So if we fire a Blast Bones and consume it, we've got the beam. Fire another Blast Bones, consume that. Boom. You can actually pop this for free for every body on the ground and restart it. So yes, if there is a bunch of ads all stacked up and they all die at the same time, you can light attack, pop, light attack, pop, light attack, pop. That is going to be tricky to maintain, but you can do it. Bone Tyrant is your tanky skill line. Death Scythe, I kind of spoiled a bit earlier, but uh, this is a big swingy scythe and it hits enemies in frontal area of effect. Kind of a cone, but it's a, a very wide cone. Now, when you apply this, this will actually heal you, but the bigger heal is for the first enemy hit. Additional enemies will give you extra heals up to five times, and the healing is scaled off of your maximum health. So as you can see here, we've got multiple targets, big heal, and then it scales. So the larger the group of enemies, the bigger the heal. Now, if you change this to Hungry Scythe, not only will it get stronger, but it also offers a heal over time for 10 seconds afterwards. Again, scaled off of your maximum health. So this is a burst heal, but it also gives you a hot afterwards. Very helpful for tanks or big chunky DPSs. Runa's Scythe, however, big twist. Big heal, bigger heal for multiple targets, no healing over time. But it does bleed damage instead. And it guarantees a hemorrhage status effect and knocks the targets off balance. The hemorrhage status effect is a damage over time um, status. It's a short duration one, but it's damage over time. And when something is hemorrhaged, it has minor mangle. Minor mangle reduces the target's health by 10% for that duration. It doesn't affect bosses, doesn't affect elites, but everything else it does. So if you maintain this and keep a healthy uptime on it, you can actually nuke 10% of the enemy's health, which means people don't have to hit it for quite so long. And also, off balance, if anyone heavy attacks that, they get 70% extra damage out of a heavy, and they get double resources back. It's really helpful. Not to mention there's a champion point passive that you can slot, which will give you more damage to off-balance targets. Basically, it's applied the same, but now they've got hemorrhage and off-balance on every single one of them. 
So they take damage and they have their health reduced. They do not get affected by it because those target dummies are counted as elites. But if it was a regular enemy, it would. That is really helpful. And again, bear in mind, this does scale off of your maximum health. The higher your health, the bigger the heal. The lower your health, the lower the heal. Nice and easy to understand. Bone armor is your resistance bonus. Every class has a major resolve bonus. This is yours. Activating it does give you nearly 6k resistances. And you look cool with spikes coming out your back. Now that lasts... Where has it gone? That lasts 20 seconds. It costs Magicka. And after it is finished, or just before it's finished, if you reactivate it, you drop a body. Yes, you can do that to it. How cool is that? Now, there are two morphs to this, and they are quite different to each other. Both of them still apply major resolve, so you've got that resistance bonus, but summoner's armor reduces the cost of your necromancer summon abilities. So, while this is active, all summon abilities that are basically your blast bones, your skeletal mage, or your spirit mender, regardless of their morph, are 15% cheaper. So you've got the cost down a lot there. The other version, however, pulls in ranged enemies and attempts to taunt them. So it reduces the cost of the ability as it ranks up, so it does start off a little uh, different. But it applies a resistance bonus, and while active, enemies that hit you from range will be pulled to you once every two seconds, and they become taunted for 15 seconds. Still drops a corpse, but this is um, quite handy in some situations, but be careful in others. So in the Endless Archive, for example, if you're a tank or you are intending on getting aggro, if you use this version of the morph and you get hit from long range, you've just gained aggro and pulled it to you. Great. But if you're a DPS, probably don't want to do that. You want this one instead. Bitter Harvest. Oh, do not leave home without this as a necromancer. This has two very different morphs. They're very different. They, act, they activate the same, but they are different outcomes. But this is what I would consider the bread and butter of the Necromancer in most cases. Basically, bodies on the ground get sucked up and you get two ultimate and you heal every one second for two seconds per corpse. And it scales off of your maximum health. On your bar, you take less damage by 3%, obviously, but the higher your health, the bigger the heal is. Technically speaking, this is your ulti gainer. So we'll have a body. And then we'll consume that and get ultimate and a heal. The more bodies, the longer the heal. So if you have six bodies on the ground, which is the cap, and yes, you can go six and six and six again, but it's only six at a time, you'll get a, a 12 second heal over time. If you cast it again, it will overwrite the old one. Now the morphs. Doubles the duration and grants major protection while active. That is incredibly powerful. Much longer heal per corpse and a stupidly powerful um, damage mitigation bonus. Or, instead of two ulti per target, you get six. That's a very, very tough choice. So this one is to gain a crap ton more ultimate. So yeah, every six targets you get 36 ulti with a heal over time. Or a longer duration heal over time with the base ulti amount and constant major protection. Either way, pick one. They are insane. Bone Totem is next. Summon an effigy of bone at your feet for 11 seconds. That grants minor protection to you and your allies, reducing the damage they take for 5%. So a mitigation bonus. After two seconds, a totem begins to fear nearby enemies every two seconds, causing them to cower in place for four seconds. So over its duration, it will just constantly stun. Fear is a stun. It doesn't make them run away. It makes them stifle on the spot. You can't do it to these targets because they are kind of considered elites. But as you can see here, constant, constant pulses of stuns. That versus other stuns is actually quite crazy because most stuns are a one-time thing. You fire it, stun, done. That's it. That one, constantly, constantly firing out extra stuns. So if something goes on cooldown now, obviously it can't be stuns. But if something accidentally falls out of it, bang, you got it again. Very, very good. In big crowd control situations, you can actually stun an enemy initially. And then once the cooldown is over, stun them again in the same skill. 
Now, there's two different versions. Allies can activate a synergy that applies minor vulnerability to all enemies inside, increasing um, in duration as the totem ranks up. So the, the higher the rank of this, because it goes from one to four, the longer that lasts. But minor vulnerability allows everyone to do more damage to the targets. 5%, in fact. So you've got minor protection and minor vulnerability at the same time. Apart from that, the synergy also does damage. So that can also be quite helpful. Make sure you take the synergies if you see this on the ground. Remote version is a little different. Instead of having a minor vulnerability, you don't actually cast this on the spot anymore. You can cast this where you want. So instead of underneath your feet, you can plan where to put it. Much easier to apply, uh, less benefits from obviously synergy effects. You don't have any. Troller fell out, brilliant. Now, Grave Grasp. One bar builds aren't gonna need this, but other people might. This is quite a unique skill, actually. It's a path in front of you for 18 meters ahead and five meters across, but it summons three patches of skeletal claws on the ground in front of you, and enemies in the first area are snared for 30% for five seconds, immobilized in the second area, and stunned in the third. So the further away they are, the, the more negative effects they receive. Each patch applies minor maim to enemies within 10 seconds, reducing their damage done by 5%. It's a healthy debuff. It's quite good. But the morphs are a little different. This increases the duration of all negative effects applied. So that is quite helpful, especially in PvP, PvE scenarios and PvP, as long as you can aim it straight. The other one you may or may not want to use depending on your group. If you've got one bar people in your group, you ain't gonna need it. But if you don't, then they are. Each area now grants allies empower and strengthens your skeletal mage and spirit menders damage and healing and reduces as this ranks up. So you apply minor maim to the enemies, empower to your allies, and you enhance the damage and healing potential of your summons by 1000 and each effect lasts 10 seconds. It is a really, really powerful skill, but it is also extremely niche. So if you can utilize it, by all means do so. But bear in mind, one bar builds are not going to benefit from that in power. You're going to need to be using your pets to benefit from that extra buff. If you aren't benefiting from empower for your group, or you're not benefiting towards your pets, maybe you're not using that many, then of course you're going to want the other one. Living death. Render flesh. I nearly had trouble saying that. That is a heal. Bear in mind, however, when you apply this, you apply minor defile to yourself. So you are negatively impacting your healing received by healing someone else a lot. That's what that toxic curse looking crap is on my body there. Now the morphs. Bear in mind, by the way, massive range. 28 meters in front, 12 meters across. It's quite wide. So as long as you're facing the target, you're pretty much good to go. But you sacrifice your own healing received for you to heal you or one ally. So bear in mind, it's going to pick the lowest one. Or the one you can see. Grant resistances to the target equal to half the amount healed. So if you do heal someone, the strength of the heal directly reflects the resistance bonus that they get. It only lasts for three seconds, but it's pretty strong. So you can make someone really, really chunky with this heal. Or, or yourself. Maybe you're solo. Maybe you've got massive healing potential. You can scale that to hell and back and get a huge amount of resistances. How you build is up to you. That can help. The other one consumes a corp to heal a second target. So we don't have a second target present. But we do have a corpse. You eat the corpse, you heal yourself and another person, or you heal two people. So that's basically your necromancer variant of a breath of life, except a much wider arc instead of a conal effect. Expunge. This is your cleanse ability. Put it on your bar while slotted. All of your abilities are 3% less. All of them. Not just necromancer abilities. All of them. This is actually quite insane as a passive bonus to have. And the negative effects removed is nice and easy. It costs nothing but health. Bear in mind, that is almost 2k. Yes, of course, that can feel like it hurts. But to be fair, 2k in one cast is nothing if you can keep on hots on the ground or whatever. 
health recovery can outlive that because you don't need to spam this. You just need to remove the negatives. Bear in mind, you can't actually activate this skill unless you have a negative. So you can't accidentally kill yourself. Expunge and modify. You restore Magicka and Stamina for each negative effect removed. So that's actually really, really helpful. You get 515 back for both resources if you remove a negative effect. Now, bear in mind, if you have six effects on you, yes, you're going to have to cast it three times. Yes, it's going to hurt your health, but you do get a lot of resources back for doing so. Hexproof, however, reduces the cost of the ability as it ranks up, so you take less health, and you remove four negative effects. So this one is resource management and negative effect removal. This one is just nuke everything off your bar. A very helpful skill. Not necessarily used that much in PvE, and because, I mean, you're limited to slots anyway. It depends on what you want to do with your build. But you can use it in PvE. But in PvP, it's very useful as long as no one's hitting you with Plague Break. Otherwise, you just go boom. Life, I mean, death. Another heal. This one will actually heal you and your allies in front of you. Or behind you, depending on where you place it. So... This won't heal you if you're not in it. You can cast it anywhere within range, but you have to be in it if you expect the heal as well. So placement is important. Bear in mind, of course, this does consume a corpse. And if you do, it will have a heal over time added to it. So while it looks a bit wet at the moment because you can't really see any major effects, if we have a corpse... Now it looks really cool. Standing inside this will give you a heal over time. Pay attention to bodies. The morphs. Consuming a corpse also removes negative effects. So if you activate it with a body on the ground, just like you saw, you'll get that effect with a heal over time and remove up to three negative effects on activation. So if you've got it down already and using it as an active heal, great. But if you see a body, cast it again. You remove stuff. Very, very helpful. This, however, consumes multiple corpses and increases the duration of the heal over time. So while one adds a heal over time and removes negative effects, this one literally just extends the hop. Spirit Mender. This is your pet. Summons a Wraith in the room. Recast him if you need to. This will last for 16 seconds, and it will heal the lowest ally every two seconds, restoring their health. But two very different morphs. Both of them do still heal, but they have different effects. This one lasts half the time and does double the heal. So very, very fast-paced, very high heals in emergencies. But it's a short duration. So bear in mind, you're going to have to use this a lot. It's quite cheap though, only 1k. The other variant does exactly the same as it did before, but while active, 10% of the damage you take is transferred to the pet. You have basically 10% damage mitigation at all times. Again, the choice is yours. It will heal the closest person or the one at the lowest health, but it will constantly give you that damage mitigation. That is a game changer, especially if you are solo or in the Endless Archive. Restoring Teva. This requires a body. Much like the Siphon ability. You have a beam. Constantly healing you. And anyone inside the beam within 28 meters. Now obviously it's not going to heal the boss. Or the dummies. But any group members caught inside that. Will also receive a heal. Now, while slotted, your healing done is increased by 3%, but we have two different morphs. This one restores Magicka and Stamina while siphoning the corpse. So as you can see, big heal over time, and you also restore 170 Magicka and 170 Stamina every two seconds while siphoning. So that's your resource recovery bonus there. Failing that, this one heals allies in a radius around you. So instead of just cutting through the beam, you have a 5 meter radius around you as well. So if we activate this again. Need the corpse. Now we have a pulsing effect around us. Anyone caught in that area, rather than just cut through the beam, 
will be healed for equivalent amount. That one's actually very, very strong in comparison to the base one. So I would usually recommend that. The resource recovery one is nice, but I mean, if you're struggling that much, you probably want to heavy attack a bit more or look at your build because your recovery is really struggling. There are other ways to recover, of course. It is helpful, but if you're in a group scenario and you're the group healer, that one is mental. Now, we're going to go over the ultimates, then we're going to have a look at the passives. So first of all, we've got Frozen Colossus. This is what I call Malcolm. Big Flesh Colossus comes out of the ground, does damage over three seconds with constant smashes, and when it deals damage, it applies major vulnerability to the enemy, all enemies hit, for 12 seconds, increasing the damage they take by 10%. Big damage boost to your group. It's not cheap, it's 175 ultimate, but there are some that are a lot, lot worse than that, so, I mean, we'll take it. 175 is not terrible. It's a big buff, though. Long duration. When this first came in, it was a short one. Now it's 12 seconds. Now you've got two morphs to this. Glacial Colossus, which is still frost damage, but increases duration of major vulnerability. And the final smash stuns all enemies. So when you max this out, you end up with 20 seconds worth of this particular skill. And everything in the area will be stunned for four seconds. So longer duration, big stun. The other variant, however... Major vulnerability for 12 seconds, just like the base version, but it does now disease damage and applies a disease status effect. But also, the damage ramps up. So while this one is consistent throughout, with all the smashes being the same with a stun and longer major vulnerability, this one is a shorter duration, but it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Both morphs look the same, within reason. It's just a different uh, particle effect, if you like, but it's this. You're broken. That is staying in the video. Bloopers normally leave the video. That one is staying in. Should we do that again? Should look like this. There he is. Big boy out of the ground. Smashes stuff. Brilliant. Major vulnerability on all targets caught inside of that. I have never seen that happen. He fell off a cliff. Moving on. Next ulti is the Bone Tyrant ulti. And you are going to love this. First morph obviously gives you the basic version of it. Which is 30k extra health instantly and heals you so you've got full health when you go into this during the transformation itself you won't take any damage whatsoever until you peak and obviously turn into it the kind of channel at the beginning uh makes you pretty much immune to attacks but once you are the colossus you have 20 seconds worth of this buff your light attacks heal you your fully charged heavy attacks heal you and it's all scaled off of your maximum health anyone can use this tank dps or healer but the more health you have the stronger that is Two different morphs. One will basically turn your bash attacks into just insane DPS. You can bash stuff, and in front of you, you do like cone or uh, tunnel-like bashes. It just gets loads of people in area of effect. It's insane. The other version, however, adds damage in an area of effect. So while this one does deal damage in a conal effect in front of you, with bashes, scaled off your offensive stats, by the way, this one adds an aura. So much like the Vampire ulti where you have the Bat Swarm, this basically puts a big circle around you and you heal. I'm going to activate that. This is absolutely insane, by the way. I've been using this in Endless Archive a lot, and while you don't have an Avatar transformation, this is very strong. Quick tip for Endless Archive. If you transform into another form in the Endless Archive, so the Werewolf, the Iron Atronarch, or the Ice Atronarch, you cannot use this. You can use any ulti in those forms, um, except for the werewolf one, obviously, but you cannot use this. So if you do get the transformation that allows you to still use ultimates, change this out during that time. Anyway, activated. We are massive. 64k health, 65 actually. Enemies close by will take damage that you'll heal off of all the damage done. And your lights and heavy attacks heal you consistently as well. So basically you're unstoppable for 20 seconds. If you see this coming at you in PvP, run. Count down from 20, and then go and kill them. You cannot, by the way, you cannot generate ultimate while you are in this form. Because that would be broken as hell, just building loads of ultimate with necrotic potency, and then just have an infinite Goliath transformation. Next ulti is the healing ulti. Doesn't technically heal. Bring your allies back from the brink of death, resurrecting up to three at the target's location. Yes, you read that correctly. 335 ultimate. 
28 meter range, 12 meter radius, which is huge. Yes, that's 24 meters across. You bring back the dead. You can res three players at once. Now, two morphs. You restore magicka and stamina for each ally you attempt to resurrect. 5,300 magicka and stam per ally. Or... You consume other corpses in the area and summon blast bones. So you bring back three people, but you also consume corpses. So any bodies on the ground, whether they're player or enemy, will turn into blast bones. Now, we can't fully demonstrate the resurrection uh, side of it, but we can demonstrate the blast bones. That pet's going to die. One more. We're now going to get three skeletons here. One, two, three blast bones. Bang, bang, bang. So that... Is your damagey version of it. Basically, you still resurrect three players, but any bodies on the ground turn into skeletons up to three, and you get three blast bones for the price of, well, none actually. So that's pretty handy. The choice is yours again, which morph you take. They're all they're all handy regardless. If you're struggling with resources a lot, then use the resource management one. If you're not and you just want more deeps, then get the exploding skellies one. Now we're gonna go into passives, and these are very important, so do pay attention. When you uh, when your Blast Bones, Skeletal Mage, or Spirit Mender dies, i.e. when you recast a new one or the previous one has run out, the cost of your next Blast Bone, Skeletal Mage, or Spirit Mender is reduced by 50%. Basically, the soon as you start combat and cast any of these skills, for the rest of the fight, using those skills is cheaper. Because one will always overlap onto the other. You've constantly got reduction to cost. That for your Spirit Mender is insane, by the way, especially if you've got the fast pace one, because that's why it's a 1,000 magicka this increases your critical strike chance against enemies at low health so under 25 percent by eight percent for each grave lord ability slotted so at the moment i've got a lot of them 32 percent increase that can go nuts yes you can fill your whole bar and if you were to do so you would get a huge bonus at low health that is your passive execute basically the lower the health the higher the crit chance when a Grave Lord ability is active, your spell and physical pen are increased by 1500. So all you need to do is have a pet active, and that's done. And increases your damage done with damage over time effects by 10%. That's all damage over time. Every single one. Even if it's not a necro ability. So these passives are important. Whenever an enemy you are in combat with dies within 28 meters of you, you restore 666. Yes, that was done on purpose. Magicka and Stamina. But you must have a Bone Tyrant ability slotted. So one of these must be on your bar. Even if it's the ultimate, one of them has to be on your bar. Otherwise, you won't get this. Reduces the damage you take from damage over time effects by 15% while you have a Bone Tyrant ability active. So as long as one of these are currently on a timer and they are running, you will benefit from this. So yes, during the Bone Tyrant uh, transformation, you take a crap ton less damage. Increases your healing received for each one slotted. And increases your max health just because you're a necromancer. You don't need any skill slotted. You just get to be one. And then you get one, two, five, zero extra health. Living death. While you have a negative effect on you, your healing done is increased by 8%. So, uh, while this actually lowers your healing received by 8%, this is a negative effect. And it increases your healing done. So, it offsets. While you have living death ability slotted, your critical strike chance with all healing abilities is increased by up to 20% in proportion to the severity of the target's wounds. So the lower their health, the higher chance you have to crit. Crit healing as a healer is not as easy as you might think. Most healers struggle to have high crit chance in comparison to DPS builds. Because lots of DPS sets, which you can use on anything. It doesn't mean you have to be a DPS to use it. You could use it on a tank if you wanted. But generally speaking, most DPS sets have the ability to stack quite nicely to give you a really good amount of crit. It's quite easy to stack 50 to 60% crit on a DPS. On a healer, not so much. This, for the Necromancer, is insane. Even if you suffer with crit chance, so you're just getting lucky occasionally rather than having loads and loads of crits, the lower their health is the better you perform. So that's a big benefit there. When you use an ability on a corpse, you generate 10 ultimate, and this can happen once every 16 seconds. So yes, of course, we've got advantage of necrotic potency, where you can take ulti back from every corpse, but 
any ability that you use on a corpse, whether it be a heal, um, a siphon, or some ulti gain, anything at all will happen once every 16 seconds and give you that back. While you have a Blast Bones, Skeletal Mage, or Spirit Mender active, your health, magicka, and stam recovery is increased. So yes, if you have your healing pet on all the time, you constantly get this recovery bonus. And that is pretty much it as far as the Necro is concerned when it comes to skills, passives, bonuses, and ultis. Just bear in mind, of course, you have ground-based skills that do damage, that have synergies attached to them that you can take advantage of. But if you have a corpse on the ground, that's stronger. You have Blast Bones abilities that obviously fire from your hands, but leave a corpse on the ground so you can take advantage of it with a siphon. You've got other abilities on the ground that can um, take advantage of corpses in the form of a heal as well. You've got lots of different ways to utilize the bodies. If you can play smart, you can be very strong. But if you just want to smash stuff, you can. Now we're going to go over some class identity boosting sets that really help the Necromancer perform. Now this isn't to say that you have to do this. This is just highlighting some of the possibilities. And we would be stupid to not demonstrate or at least explain one of the new sets. The Elder Scrolls Online has over 600 sets in the game. Any class, any race, any role, any sets you like without restriction until now. We have a class set for the Necromancer. If you go into the Endless Archive, you will find Nobility in Decay. Casting a Bone Tyrant ability while in combat grants you Beautiful Corpse and Death's Favor for 16 seconds. Yes, that lines up perfectly with the 10 ulti once every 16 seconds. Death's Favor increases your healing taken and reduces your damage taken by up to 12% based on your missing health. So the lower the health, the bigger the heals, the less damage you take. This can occur once every 20 seconds and is reduced by two seconds for each Bone Tyrant ability slotted. So if you have two Bone Tyrant abilities, this can happen once every 16 seconds rather than every 20. If you have six Bone Tyrant abilities on your bar, you can use this really fast. You take off 12 seconds. So you can maintain this indefinitely, quite easily, depending on how you build. Bear in mind, of course, casting a corpse consuming ability consumes beautiful corpse. And it treats you as a corpse. So basically, you don't need a body on the ground. Now, I'm going to briefly demonstrate this, which I don't normally do in these videos. Because we need to see what this looks like. Because otherwise, this isn't going to make a lot of sense. Some abilities do make sense right off the bat. Some need to be seen. So, for those trying to make a new necromancer and wondering, is the new set worth it? Because you copied those words off of Google. Well, I'm about to demonstrate why they might be if you want to benefit from higher healing, damage mitigation, and a rather handy mobile version of corpses. All you need to do is cast a Bone Tyrant ability. Now bear in mind, you do need to be in combat. As you can see, it won't fire. Now, what else can we do with this? If we have Detonating Siphon, which is this one here. I can't fire this without a body. I need to fire a Blast Bones, and that will put the corpse at the foot of the enemy and I can use it here, right? Not anymore. Don't need to do that. What I can do instead is while I'm in combat, I can cast a Bone Torrent ability. I am the corpse. I am the bomb. I am a walking bomb. Constantly doing damage to enemies that I stand next to without the need for a beam. So as long as I maintain a Bone Tyrant ability once every so often, I can recast that on myself. The beam normally has to cut very finely through the enemies. But with this set, I am the one with the air of effect attached to me. That is a game changer. Anyone that comes near you is in trouble. Not to mention, of course, one other very important thing. If you have this active while you have one of your healing skills on, which is this one here.
I am the target for the heals. I can place that without fail. Nothing needs to be dead right now. I can start the fight with a heal over time. Endless possibilities. Okay, they're limited, but still. That is how you utilize that set. And hopefully, that offers some insight. Now, in the meantime, I want to go over some, again, aesthetically pleasing sets towards the Necromancer. Let's go into some DLC dungeons. Let's go into Unhallowed Grave. And, of course, we're going to take advantage of this one that I can't pronounce. That is a skeletal mask, which looks mega. But if you do a light attack to the target, it will stack up a bonus. After five stacks, it will raise a giant necromancer fist out from underneath the ground and punch them in the face hard. That is mega. Looks awesome. Hits like a steam train. There are quite a few, actually. We could be here for some time. I'm not going to go over absolutely everything, but um, Fang Lair. Very necromancer-esque because there's a necromancer in that. It happens to raise a dragon. Spoilers, I know. You've got Kalurian. That is actually a necromancer that you do fight. And what he does is he has these lich crystals that appear above his head. And then he fires stuff at the enemy. For a DPS, that is actually really, really fun. Every single time you do damage, as soon as you crit with a light or a heavy, you can apply projectiles at random damage types from frost, flame, disease, or shock. And it can happen once every five seconds. Quite strong. Nice crit bonuses. Very good for DPS. Again, um, we've got... Where have you gone? Basic dungeons. We're going to go with Bloodspawn. This is classic. This doesn't look very necro-y. But it does affect you like a necro. So this actually gives you ultimate for being hit. Maximum level, that will give you a crap ton. And all you have to do is take damage. So we have very, very cool ultimates that we do want to utilize that are really expensive. This will help you generate ultimate very, very fast. Can't really go wrong with that one. Also in Spindle Clutch, you do have a set that also works the same as your skill. So if you have the resistance buff that pulls enemies in and taunts them, you can also stack it with this. And when you block an enemy that is between 8 to 22 meters away from you, you pull them in. And you can do this once a second. So while you have this on, while you have your resistance bonus on that pulls every two seconds, these can stagger together and you can pull in a whole room very, very quickly. So while visually, maybe not so aesthetically pleasing for the Necromancer, actively, most definitely yes. This lines up perfectly with one of your skills. Now, as far as healing is concerned, remember that we have a bonus to low health targets, like we crit more? Well, if they're below 50% health, you give them a bonus for three seconds. If you successfully put them to 90% health when the effect ends... You and the ally gain major heroism, boosting your ulti regen. And this can happen once every 20 seconds per target. So if you've got a group of people that are very, very low health, you take advantage of your necro passives and get extra crit healing at low health. They will rapidly go up to full health and they can benefit from really fast ulti regen. This is a buff to the group if they're alive. So... Again, this is a trial set. You don't have to have perfected or whatever, but there, there are two variants, the normal version and the perfected version. There, there's only one difference between the two, and the difference is the extra health bonus, and that's it. But basically, while this is max level, because this isn't showing us the proper stats, your group gets 180 weapon and spell damage based on a number of group members alive. Remember, we're a necromancer. We deal with death and stuff, obviously. So they have a benefit for being alive. But... When people start dying, the group gets damage reduction from non-player enemies up to 66% of it based on the number of group members that are dead. So while people are alive, you get a weapon and spell damage bonus to the group. While people are dead, you get a mitigation bonus to the group. Regardless of how that looks visually, that is very necro. So that had to be mentioned. And one obvious one that is mentioned throughout, because people seem to think it only applies to the Necro, 100% inaccurate, by the way. This can actually apply on any class. You just need three different elemental types of damage. Spoiler, Crush and Shock does that straight away. Anyway, sidestep. Now, if you go to Stone Garden, you will find Elemental Catalyst. Now, this is quite simple. Whenever you deal damage with Flame, Shock, or Frost, you put a, a benefit on the target, a bonus, to crit damage for people that hit it. 
So it's a debuff to the target of sorts, but technically it's a buff to the group. Anyone that hits that has a critical damage increase of 5% per elemental bonus. So if it's got only flame applied, it will do a 5% bonus. If it's got only shock, then 5% and only frost 5%. But if you've got flame and shock, that's now 10. Flame, shock and frost, that's now 15. So it's 5% per elemental type. Now what you basically need to do is just make sure that you bring all three damage types when you apply damage. So if you have crushing shock, that brings all three. Spam that all day long, you've got infinite uptime on this particular set bonus. Or if you're trying to do stuff in error of effect, then you can take advantage of an error of effect frost damage ability, an error of effect fro shock damage ability, and maybe an error of effect flame damage ability. That's trickier to maintain and you'll need three separate skills for it instead of one, but the Necromancer can easily do that. If you apply your Boneyard, which is Frost, your pet, your Arcanist, the magical one, which is direct damage initially, but it does splash with lightning. And then of course, you've got access to the Blast Bones, which if you take the flame version, that's error of effect as well. Or you could Lightning Wall, Flame, Blast Bones, and Unnerving Boneyard on the ground. And all of those, again, stack in error of effect. So you've got a constant uptime on it. How you apply that is entirely up to you. You can do it with any class, but because the Necromancer has actually got Frost, Flame, and Shock in its arsenal, it's favored among Necromancers. So I would be shot if I didn't mention this set. Anyway, hopefully that gives you some kind of insight as to what you can and can't do with a Necromancer. There are countless possibilities in this game. Absolutely tons of things you can do. If in doubt, try it out. But of course, the most important one that I had to directly demonstrate was the Nobility and Decay. Running around as a walking bomb is absolutely nuts. Now, hopefully that helped. If you haven't seen the other Necromancer videos, obviously there's one at the top left-hand side, which is the Lazy Bones, which is a one-bar Magicka Necro. Top right-hand side, there's Malcolm, which is a tank. Bottom left-hand side, you are looking at the Cultist build, which is actually a bit of a hybrid. And the bottom right-hand side, obviously the guide to the Endless Archive with over 68 bosses demonstrated. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.